What's up guys, welcome back. Every once in a while I neglect to get the big camera out and record a proper intro and this is one of those times because I am just too stoked to take the time to do it. As you can see the engine is installed in the Model A. This is like a year and a half in the making. I am beyond stoked right now. It's been so long since I've gotten to drive this thing. I am so excited. Now, as said in the last episode, we've only got about two weeks until we have to have this thing up and running. So if you haven't subscribed yet, you should. You'll wanna be here for this. We're working overtime to get this thing done. And when it is done, I promise to do the biggest, fattest sitter I have ever done in my entire life. Let me show you guys what it took to get to this point over the last couple of days. Let's dive in. A few days ago, our crate motor arrived. And as explained last time, this is a five liter Illuminator SC engine, which means it's got fully forged internals and a lowered compression ratio built specifically to be supercharged. I got quite lucky when I found this particular engine because although it's not technically new, it's got no miles on it. The previous owner bought this for a Shelby truck before realizing that trucks have a different firing order than cars when it comes to coyote based engines. So this one went back in its crate and it came to me for half the price of one off the shelf. Not to mention new ones are unavailable. So we've got what we can call a new engine and a slew of parts from the old one that we need to install. All of the engine accessories, our supercharger, the intercooler, the clutch setup, and further down the line, the absolutely incredible equal length header and exhaust system that we built at Proto Machine a couple of years ago. But before we can install any parts, we need to strip the new engine down to its bare essentials. More or less everything has to go from the intake manifold to the water pump and pretty much every factory accessory. We're not gonna use any of it. The first pieces we need to install are the AN adapted water ports for the top of the cylinder heads. And I found this out the hard way the first time I built one of these motors because they are all but impossible to install once the supercharger is in place. With the knock sensors in place and torque to spec, I went on and installed the water to air intercooler, which sits below the supercharger and has the charged air going through it before going into the intake ports of the heads. Up next is the blower itself. This is a VMP Gen 3R TVS 2.65 liter supercharger. And while it's more than happy making over 1200 horsepower, we're not gonna push it nearly that hard. At least not yet, because the Model A will be more than quick enough making about 700 horsepower at the rear wheels. Because of the unorthodox cooling system in the Model A with the radiator at the back of the truck, we don't use a standard Coyote water pump. In its place, we've got a water plate, rather similar to what we used on the K24 in the Ferrari. Paired with it, we use an electric Davies Craig water pump, which so far has done a great job of keeping the Model A cool. But we do have one other cooling trick up our sleeve. Coyotes are known for running hot at the rear cylinders if you really push them to their limit but if we hammer out the freeze plugs, we can use a crossover system to allow coolant to flow from head to head. And this does a really good job of keeping those rear cylinders from getting too hot. Although I didn't get to drive it much, I never saw coolant temps get above about 180 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 degrees Celsius previously. Normally, these two ports would be connected by just a hose, but you can see I've added a block to the top, and this is to allow me to bleed the cooling system more effectively. This engine's prone to air bubbles if not bled correctly, and having the radiator above the height of the entire engine only adds to the difficulty. Here, we're at the most absurd part of the supercharger installation. Even on a brand new engine, you have to cut away parts of your timing cover. This is necessary because we have to make room for the front end accessory drive bracketry. Because the supercharger is belt driven and we are rearranging the serpentine belt setup, we need room for additional pulleys and brackets. You can see here why clearance needs to be added.
After a bit of cleanup though, the front of this thing is coming together nicely. So I think I did a pretty good job of keeping all of the parts that came off of the old motor when I sent it out to get rebuilt together. Everything went into that box down there, or it sat on top of this table, which is a piece of plywood stacked on top of some replacement tires. Everything was right here, except I could not find the engine mounts. And I spent a couple of hours tearing everything in this shop apart, trying to figure out where I put them. I must have done something creative with them. Well, no, they were with everything else. But yes, I did do something creative, AKA really stupid. I put the engine mounts inside of the tires under the plywood. It was such a dumb place to put them. Hiding right with everything else. But I found them, I don't have to remake them, which I'm happy about, so yeah, there's that. I feel like an idiot. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't have to remake the motor mount arms. I thought for a minute there's no way I'd find them, but I did, so it's as simple as bolting them on. For the next steps, we need to lift the engine up off of the pallet, but I've made a mess of the shop making the progress so far, and I need to stop and clean up a bit. For one, the mess is too stressful to get anything done, and two, we're gonna need room for the gantry and to roll the Model A into place. Now, if you've been watching, you know what can happen if you use straps to lift an engine. So this time I've got proper axle straps to hook around our engine mounts and some chain and some D-rings to hook it all together. We should be in business this time. A little bit of coolant did spill out of the intercooler when I lifted this thing up, but otherwise, this went perfectly. And I happened to get pretty lucky on finding the balance point of the engine right off the bat. Up next is the flywheel, the clutch assembly, and the motor plate for the transmission. And these are the only parts that I didn't actually have here at the shop. These went with the old motor to the engine builder, and I had to have these overnighted back here to the shop this morning so I could have them in time for this episode. Otherwise, we'd still be looking at an engine on a pallet. After torquing the flywheel to spec, I installed the two clutch discs. I'm using a McLeod Twin Disc RXT clutch setup, which should be more than capable of holding this power level and is supposed to be street friendly, although obviously the NASCAR dog box that we have is not, so it's kind of a moot point. The last thing we need to do before we drop the engine into place is to remove the old wiring from the Model A. We're not going to be keeping the Ford Controls Pack ECU and wiring harness, so we need to get rid of it while we still have access to the panels behind the engine. It'll at least save us a lot of effort right now versus having to thread everything later. All of the Model A's electronics are hidden underneath what used to be the factory gas tank. Instead of having a gas tank on the cowl, I cut it and gutted it, and instead, we now have things like the ECU, the fuse panel, an arc panel, and the pedals. Everything that I didn't want visible on this thing to keep it looking at least somewhat old school are hidden here. More or less all of the wiring from the Model A is gonna go, at least everything for the engine. All of the things like fuel pumps and transmission pumps are wired separately, and they're good to remain how they are. And with that, it's finally time to drop the engine in place. Just two bolts hold the front grill on, and with it removed, it's time to do this. With no engine bay to deal with, installing the engine is, by most measures, quite easy. The only thing that offers any challenge is the fact that we do need to line the input shaft of the transmission up with the clutch discs and into the pilot bearing. 
Normally that's relatively easy, but we're limited on room thanks to the oil pan. So this is definitely a bit of a song and dance in order to get the two to go together. There's a lot of pushing and a lot of shoving, especially doing this solo, as there's only a small window where the two will actually mate and drop into place. Removing the transmission and mating it to the engine before dropping them in is a different challenge entirely. This method, while pretty goofy, is definitely easier. Trust me. <sighs> All right, I'm wiped. That was a workout getting it in, and uh, it's in, it's bolted in, it's sitting on its engine mounts. Khalil cruised in at just the right time at the last minute to help me get it seated and, and in there, and uh, this is 18 months in the making. I am so stoked. I wish that it was a Gen 1 so that we could just plug it in and I'd have this thing running tonight, but unfortunately, it is going to be at least a week before it's up running because we've got to put a full Haltech standalone on it and what have you. But I'm excited about this. All right, I'm gonna take a breather for a second and then we'll talk about a handful of other things for the next episode for this build, what we got going on, and then we'll find that outro somewhere in there. All right, I've caught my breath. Got a couple of things to share. The first is, as mentioned, we've got to do a standalone setup. Haltech has hopped on board. They're gonna provide their plug and play setup for this thing, which I'm pretty pumped about. The only snag is that there is one left in the entire world. They are not continuing that product anymore. The one remaining one is in the UK. There are several SKUs, depending on what engine you have, what type of injector connector, things like that. It just so happens that this one matches exactly what we need. So the gods of speed are smiling upon us. Haltech is sending that over to the US right now and we will have to get it all set up and tuned and what have you. Next on the list, I talked to my longtime friends over at Rotoform and they are rush building a new set of wheels for this thing. I'm excited to show you guys. It's a concept that I've had for this truck ever since I finished it up. Don't get me wrong, the Lama wheels that are on it are sick and they're not gonna leave. I'm still gonna keep them. There's nothing wrong with having more than one set of wheels for the thing, but this new set is going to be sweet. I had to spend a couple of hours earlier this week taking all sorts of measurements and doing some figuring. We're gonna keep the center lock set up and I'm really excited to show you guys once those arrive, should be within give or take two weeks because that's about all the time we've got. Last but not least, I need to lead by example here. A bunch of you guys commented on the last episode pointing out that I broke a rule. I used brake cleaner to clean a welding surface. And if you aren't aware, you should never do that. Brake clean has no business being anywhere near a welder or welding surfaces. And the reason is because chlorinated brake cleaner can create phosgene gas when you combine it with argon and when you arc over it or pass a current over it or something to that effect. I'm not a scientist. Either way, it can create phosgene gas, which is absolutely lethal. And it's lethal at like four parts per million or something extremely small. It's very dangerous and it's a big risk. Every welder should know you never use brake cleaner to clean things off. Now, I will say, just to comfort everybody, I'm using non-chlorinated brake clean, which won't create phosgene gas. It's still not good for you, but it's not this massive risk. But with that said, I need to be leading by example when I have an audience. I need to make sure I'm not doing something that can be risky on camera. I, I need to make sure that I'm not ever gonna put somebody else in a position where they could hurt themselves. So I'm gonna make sure I don't do that again. I'm gonna keep the acetone, the big drum of it that I've got, next to the welding bench. I'm not gonna get lazy and whip out that brake clean again. I'm gonna make sure I lead by example. I wanna thank you guys for calling me out on it because like I said, I got lazy, I got comfortable, and I shouldn't be doing that. So thank you guys. With that said, this episode's a wrap. I'll catch you guys on Tuesday. I got a bunch of stuff coming. We're gonna make some good progress. I'll see you then. Thank you as always for the support.